All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Craig Weber of the Weber Consulting Group, who is up in Lancaster, California, just north of LA. How are you doing, Craig? I'm doing well. Thank you, John. Appreciate the invitation to uh, spend a little time with you here today. Absolutely. And what we're going to talk today about is his book, Conversational Capacity, The Secret to Building Successful Teams That Perform When the Pressure is On. Okay, so Craig, I always like to ask this uh, when people write books about the genesis of the book. Like, what, what prompted you to write it in the first place? Well, my background academically is in organizational development and organizational psychology. And I got really interested early on in the core research that informs the work. Chris Arger is at Harvard, Don Schoen at MIT. And so that kind of started it. And I've been working for years to try to take that research and help people apply it to their organizations and teams in a very focused, very deliberate way. Yeah. And I see, I mean, you open with uh, co the idea of conversational capacity, the missing piece of the puzzle. So what do you mean by conversational capacity? Yeah, great question. Um, one way to think about it is it's the ability of an individual or a team to have constructive learning focused dialogue about really difficult subjects in challenging circumstances or across tough boundaries. And if mm. conversational capacity is high, for example, a team can put an extremely difficult issue on the table and do good work around it where with low conversational capacity, a minor difference of opinion will often screw up a meeting. So it's sort of yeah. a pivotal piece of team performance, but not something we're paying as much attention to as I think we should. So again, sort of that missing piece in the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it is interesting because I think uh, obviously uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of you are very good at vague conversations, <laughs> very good at, uh, as you say, when especially in this culture, I don't know why, but even more so than ever, people are so conflict averse that when a difference, as you say, if a difference of opinion comes up, it can just derail, not just the diff the two people maybe who's having the difference of opinion, but everybody else gets really tense because, ooh, there's there's a little bit of disagreement coming up, so everybody gets quiet. So it, it seems to me that, as you said, the missing piece of the puzzle, this is really critical and that we understand how to converse uh, more effectively and optimally. Right, yeah. And so in my work, I'm working with everything from uh, you know, business leaders, nonprofit organizations, even working with a number of legislators uh, in a number of U.S. states, helping Republicans and Democrats engage in policy debate more constructively. And I think you know, all around the world, like you say, there's an increasing or growing need for the ability to have more rigorous, balanced, constructive dialogue where it counts. Well, I think you're going to be a busy man if you're working with them for <laughs> a busy man for a long time because there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, so how do you go about, when you, when you start a process like that, how do you go about, I, I mean, number one, how, how can you show people maybe what they're doing today is not working, is not serving them? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we end up talking about in conversational capacity is this sweet spot in a conversation where two things are in relative balance. On the one hand, it's candor. Things are open and honest and forthright and direct. On the other hand, it's curiosity. People are open-minded, they're inquisitive, they're there to learn. And what we show people is when you and when a team leaves that sweet spot, we pay an enormous price for it in terms of performance. If we leave the sweet spot by dropping candor, for example, we're conflict avoidant, we're overly guarded mm -hmm. and cautious hard to get good work done. And what often happens, we trigger out of the sweet spot the other way and lose curiosity. We're suddenly arrogant and argumentative. As I say uh, a lot in my workshops, the basic problem is our mind shuts and our mouth opens, which is never a good look on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, no, I love it. Um, and then, you know, you talk about uh, um, when good intentions aren't enough and you talk about intentional conflict. So first of all, what is intentional conflict? Yeah, that's a great. What, what I mean by an intentional conflict isn't that we intend to get into a conflict. It's that our intentions themselves in a tough conversation are often at odds with each other. So I may go into a meeting wanting to give a colleague some really clear, very cl uh, useful feedback. But then what happens is I need to keep things calm, cool, and collected to avoid conflict hijacks my good intentions, and I behave in a way that contradicts them. I water down my feedback, I don't say anything at all perhaps, or I bring it up in a hallway to a colleague, another colleague after the meeting. And so what often happens under pressure is emotional reactions grounded in the fight-flight response 
often hijack our good intentions. So you get that intentional conflict. And so learning to recognize those emotional reactions and to act more intentionally despite them is at the core of building your conversational capacity and that of your team. Yeah, and it's fascinating because, um, like I said, I mean, we live in a, such a strange culture today where, uh, you know, people people are happy to have conflict as long as it's at an arm's length and they have a computer between them or a phone or something. Face right. to face, everybody's in conflict uh, avoidance and, and we've been sort of sold this idea that everything should be happy and light, but that's not how things get done. And I think we've lost, I mean, this is why I think your work is very important because we've lost the ability to to be candid in a in a responsible way well said i think that's right how can i be how can i be candid direct and no nonsense in a way that increases rather than decreases the learning that's going on it's easy to be candid and direct in a way that lowers the learning we see that all sure. the time especially <laughs> on social media but i think the real trick here is to be honest open direct and do it in a way that encourage other encourages other people to respond the same way especially when they see things differently when they don't see things the way we do uh, and I think obviously part of the problem is uh, that you have to establish that you all have a shared goal at the end of the day, right? Right. I think so. Yeah, exactly right. Even if it's a very basic goal, we want to walk out of this meeting smarter and more informed. We may not agree with each other, but imagine if we used our differing perspectives and opinions to expand and improve how we're thinking about the issue we're facing or the problem we're trying to solve or the decision we're trying to make. So I think if you want to get better at working in that candid and curious state, you need to adopt a mindset, which goes right to your point. Learning needs to be the key objective. And if that makes me less comfortable than I tend to want to feel, so be it. If that makes me feel a little less Mr. Got Things all figured out than I tend to want to feel, so be it. And so that ability to set aside your base emotional reactions in the pursuit of learning, thinking more clearly, and making better choices, that's sort of the mindset I help people learn to adopt, where the people around the table who have a different point of view are actually the most useful people at the table. They're an opportunity to learn, not an obstacle to learning. Yeah, there was an interesting. Uh, there was an interesting exercise that uh, I used to do some years ago that uh, I had heard of, and it was called a crush session. It's a, and it was where you had, if somebody was you know passionate about something and another person was passionately opposed to it, you actually switched them and said, okay, you now argue in favor of the thing that you're against, the other person argue against it, and so it was actually fascinating when you do that because suddenly people see things very differently and, right. and you, you, know, you can come to some resolution. But, but I think the bigger point here is, is the fact that being able to have those discussions and being able to disagree, because that's the other thing I think that's pervasive in the culture right now is that you're not allowed to disagree. You just, if I disagree with you, uh, Craig, I just, I just don't talk to you anymore and I go off and find somebody who agrees with me. Yes. We tend to love our little intellectual silos, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you so how do you get beyond that when you talk about, you know, a more intentional mindset? How do you get people into that mindset? Because I don't think that comes naturally today no. to a lot of people. I think two things you got to show people is what's the price we're paying for our current way of approaching conflict. It's not it's not. And then what are the advantages you gain if you're willing to see people who view the world differently as an opportunity to learn, not to agree with them, but to learn, mm -hmm. to expand your thinking, to have a more nuanced view of the situation you're in. And I think um, once you start showing people what's the price they pay and what are the advantages they gain if they make some adjustments, I see a lot of people get extremely excited about this. Um, and then not only is there a mindset you can adopt, there's a set of skills, actual behaviors, two candor skills and two curiosity skills. And so it becomes really operational at that point. They're thinking differently. They're recognizing their emotional reactions and when it puts their effectiveness at risk. And then they've got some actual behaviors they can use to kind of, you know, uh, you know, align their behavior with their good intentions, even when they're being emotionally triggered, which takes a little work. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Uh, so what are just at a very high level? What are some of those uh, what are some of those um, skills? Yeah, so there's four basic skills. And the candor skills really are, you know, put your view on the table and explain it. Show people how you're currently making sense of an issue, a problem. And, you know, man, so put your view on the table and explain the thinking that got you there. When the curiosity mm -hmm. side, we do two things. One, which is kind of unusual, is we actually test our perspective. We're actually curious, what am I missing? Are people seeing something I'm not? Am I missing some evidence? Am I making an erroneous assumption? And so I actually invite people to help me clarify my thinking. If they see a problem with it, I don't just sit back 
back passively, hoping they'll share their view. I invite them to do it. I encourage them to do it. I can also use inquiry to invite other perspectives into the conversation. And so if someone's not participating in a meeting, I might invite them in by saying, Tom, we haven't heard from you yet. I'd mm-hmm. love to get your spin on this issue. What's your take on the problem we've been discussing? And so this can the, the, put your view out there with these candor skills, test your view and pull other views into the conversation with the curiosity skills. And what's nice about this is one person in a meeting with these skills can have a profound impact on the way that meeting unfolds, but the way a decision gets made. Yeah, and, and I love that because uh, you're right. Uh, Again, as I said, you know, today, you know, a lot of people confuse opinion with fact, you know, and this because this is what I think is right. Therefore, it is right. Um, but as you say, the value of being surrounded by intelligent people and being on a team is that it should all boats should rise. All ideas should get better. So if I bring an idea to you, if I bring an idea to the table, uh, it should be challenged. It should be improved upon. Maybe it should even be rejected if that's the right thing. Right. Absolutely. And that's the key to having, you know, having learning in the driver's seat is sort of enables that, right? Where I'm less interested in the ego massage and more interested in making a smart choice and working with other people to generate the clear thinking we need to make that choice. And so I've got to sort of subordinate um, my emotional reactions that get in the way of that to the, to the process of learning, engaging with people who see things differently. So absolutely. And shared ownership, because I think that's one of the other things is unfortunately, We've also grown up in a corporate culture of like, you know, where people are very, you know, they're very intent on having their name and their stamp on something. Whereas if you're going to engage in a team and stuff at the end of the day, it's going to be a collective win or a collective lose, right? Now, that's a really good point. And, you know, I talk about conversational capacity being a conversational martial art and the opponent is not the other person or persons. It's not the issue or even the context in which everything's unfolding. In this conversational martial art, if we're going to stay in that a sweet spot, focused on learning, our opponents are ego. And so we've got to be able to set aside those more base ego driven reactions and focus on what really matters in a conversation. What is the purpose here? What are we trying to accomplish together? And what's the learning we can do together to try to accomplish that objective in the most constructive and learning focused way possible? So I think if we want to be better leaders, if we want to be better salespeople, if we want to be better teammates, we've got to become better human beings, less driven by our base emotional impulses and ego and driven more by the better angels of our nature, candor, curiosity, and purpose. You know, what are we trying to get done here? Yeah, no, I love that. And, and uh, I love the, uh, the, the conversational martial art that you talk about, because as, as a martial artist myself, um, I would agree with you. When you do martial arts, right, there will always be somebody better than you, bigger, more flexible, stronger, more nimble, maybe smaller, but faster, whatever. There's, there's always going to be this. So you can't, you can't compare yourself. You have to, your biggest, in martial arts, you know, your biggest opponent is yourself, as you say, which you're, uh-huh. is that's who you have to focus on because you can't, if you, if you start comparing, you'll never get anywhere. You'll, you'll paralyze yourself. Exactly. And, and what do you get out of that, really? Except, uh, you know, you know, a, a lot of frustration. Yeah, a lot of frustration is <laughs> self deflation, right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I like that. I think so. Uh, that's why I think you know, martial artists get this in a way because they're used to. They recognize that when I'm out of there on the mat, the other person I'm working, I'm working with or grappling with is not my opponent. I am no. my opponent. Yeah, and the other person is there to help you get better. Actually, and that's why I think if we go back to what we were talking about earlier, when you are having these discussions and maybe they're candid and maybe it looks like conflict, you know, actually they're they're helping the idea get better. Just like when you are, you know, working with somebody in, in you know, in martial arts or whatever, you're, you're the opponent, they're helping you get better. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. It reminds me of uh, William Shatner in an interview with Esquire magazine a few years ago said, we meet aliens every day who have something to give us. They come in the form of people with different opinions. <laughs> I love that. This, that's a great place to uh, to conclude on today. Hey, we conclude with a William Shatner quote. What could be better than go. that? <laughs> so listen, Craig, before we go, can you tell people a little bit more about uh, the, the Weber Group and what you do and how they can learn more about you? Yeah, so a bunch of colleagues and I, we team up and we work with, uh, like I say, organizations of every size and every kind, helping people work together more effectively in challenging circumstances. Um, If you want to learn more, conversationalcapacity.com. I've got uh, two books, Conversational Capacity, which came out a few years ago. And then the most recent book just came out, Influence in Action, which is a deeper dive into the concepts and skills as well as a workbook, especially for an individual who wants to build their conversational capacity. 
Yeah, and I would highly recommend uh, people to check this out because I do think, uh, and not to be doom and gloom, I still sound like I'm doom and gloom about the pervasive culture today, but I do think we're losing a lot of the capacity to have you know, different to have creative conversations and difficult conversations and breakthrough conversations, and I think that's such a shame. And we need to <clears throat> we need to relearn some of these skills. So I'd highly recommend you checking out uh, Craig's work. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. And thanks again, Craig, for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you.